Hey everyone, we are back. It's Ginny and Tash with Riding in the Weeds, episode 19. And today we are talking about putting yourself where you want to be. This episode is for you if you find yourself being battered around by the forces of life and you're ready to be in control. So we're just going to talk about how if we're present and we're here and we embody that we can create so much more goodness in our lives and we can really put ourselves where we want to be and get further, faster, with less frustration. So let's just dive on in. Ginny, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Tosh. How are you? I am doing good. Thank you. It's a sunny day, but started out kind of cool here. I don't know. Summer's not quite really settling in, which is good because there's no fires. That is good. I wish I could give you some of our heat. We've been sweltering for like two weeks now. So that's fun. Yeah. Right. I'm like, you can keep it. I'm okay. We sweltered on the weekend. I love it, but I'm also okay with the lack of too much heat for our bike camps and the little kids on bikes. It's so much more fun when they're not sweltering in the heat. So I'll go back to Mexico for some heat. It's all good. So, and on that note, like there's a force that you cannot control, right? So I find that one really interesting. During the summertime, we plan our events and our bike events because where I want to be is in a space where the kids aren't too hot, that there's not too much smoke. We generally have more smoke in August, so we do less stuff. So it's like digging into the what of putting yourself where you want to be. What are we actually talking about here? So I want to start at the most basic level with this, and that is really understanding what it means to be embodied. I think that as human beings in our culture, and our society, we are discouraged from really being present truly in our physical body. And so what happens is we run around basically in our heads with our hands. Everything is in our hands in front of us. Our phones are in our hands. We're always looking at our hands. We're grabbing things with our hands. And therefore, the rest of our physical body doesn't matter. And this has some pretty big implications, which I think is where we want to start diving into this, because the consequences of not being in your body in our sports can be pretty big. To start with, when you're riding a horse and you're not very well embodied, number one, the animals don't appreciate it when you're not physically present in your body. They sense that right away, and it is a little disconcerting to them because that's not natural. So number one, right off the bat, you have an issue with them connecting with you energetically because you're not physically present. But then when you're not in your body on the horse, you're not able to affect your own balance appropriately and receive information from what is happening underneath you. And when you're disconnected like that, it just leads to a whole bunch of things not working well, and you're not able to influence the horse's balance in the right direction. So that's my side of the equation. So I'm going to toss it back to you to talk about what happens when you're not in your body on your bike. Yeah, well, it's really the same thing. You become reactive. It's funny because the bike is an inanimate object, but yet when you are riding it so often, we tend to think that we get our balance from the bike. And so people will hug their knees. They'll hold onto the bike. They're holding onto those handlebars so tightly. And this all kind of really came into my head a couple of weeks ago when I was working with some girls in a bike session. And one of the girls said to me, yeah, but Tash, I can't think about what I'm doing on the bike and think about what my body's doing at the same time. And I was like, well, honestly, you don't need to think about the bike. Think about your body, look down the trail and start to think about where you need to be. And instead of reacting to the bike and where the bike is, because that's in the past, like what is happening on the bike is actually reacting to what has just happened on the trail. Whereas if you start to look down the trail, you can really see, okay, there's a nice straightaway coming up. So I'm going to rebalance. I'm going to get my feet level. I'm going to look ahead. I'm going to make sure that I am nice and solid. Am I needing to be low? Am I needing to be high? When we're not reacting to something on the trail, we generally want to be 
higher on the bike. We want to use our bones to support us because it doesn't take as much energy. And then when things get a little gnarly and a little spicy, we want to have our legs, they want to stay fairly straight. So again, we're allowing the bones to support us. And then we lower our arms, we lower our chest down to the handlebars and we use our shoulder force, we use our core, we use our hips to then support us and we use those muscles and tendons which support us over and give us a suspension over the bumpy bits or if we're going a little faster, getting lower will support us in that. And just to add to that, the other thing about getting low is when you're high up on the bike, when you're looking at everything in life, you're not focused. You can see all of the different things and you're like, what do I do? What do I respond to? Whereas when you get a little lower, you can actually see what's just directly ahead of you on the trail. And that allows you to focus in on what is the most important thing that I need to deal with right now, right? And as I say, whether you're riding a bike or you're in life or you're on a horse or you're doing any of these different things, like as soon as you sink in to what is happening next, where do I need to be next? It makes it a lot easier to make all of the decisions. And now I've just opened up the Pandora box of all the different ways we could take this conversation, but bringing it back to that bike. If you think about where your body needs to be next on the trail, you can work with the four ranges of motion, which are up and down, side to side, forward and back, and rotation. And I'm pretty sure those ranges of motion are the exact same when you're on the horse. And I often like to think about it as well when you're dancing with somebody. We're dealing with the ranges of motion. And if we can be embodied and be present, we're able to move within those ranges of motion. Otherwise, we get really rigid. And when you don't move, you can't move. Yeah. What's fascinating is you're exactly right. All of those ranges of motion are available when you're riding. The interesting thing is not only do we as a physical human being on a body have that range of motion, our horse has the exact same range of motion at the same time. So now you're attempting to match two bodies with all of those different directions of available movement at the same time. What's interesting to me is I, you can get the example of being in a canoe or a kayak or stand up paddleboard or even a surfboard. We would never attempt to control the water when we're in a canoe or on the water in that situation, even skiing, you can't control the snow. So why is it that when we get on a bike or get on a horse, we think we can control that movement? And the reality is we can't. And we have to do the exact same thing as when we're in a canoe or on the water. So we have to respond to the forces that are coming through the bike, through the horse, from the earth, and deal with whatever that is. When we deal with that movement in our own body as the priority, everything underneath us is going to organize and work itself out. And I love that. that. You're so right. Everything will work itself out when we are in our bodies. We are present to what we need versus trying to respond to the force that is coming at us in any given moment. The advantage over a water situation is that at least with a horse, when you get really well organized, they can organize themselves. So if you even imagine carrying a little kid on your back, if you're playing piggyback with a kid, if that kid is up there squirming around all over the place, you're going to struggle. And it's the same thing when we're riding a horse. If we're up here all over the place and squirming around, they're going to struggle. We cannot expect them to balance well if we're up there all over the place. And really the same works out with your bike. If you're all over the place above your bike and you're not in your body to be able to coordinate your own movement then your bike will be all over the place. I know I always find that when I end up tired, when I'm out on the trail and I end up tired because I have one leg that's very strong and one leg that's weaker. And every time I start to fatigue, my bike just like, you know, if I have to push off, I'm like, you know, I wobble really bad because of the difference in the strength and I'm tired. 
So therefore, I'm not able to coordinate my body as effectively at that point. And it becomes really grossly obvious when I'm already super tired from a long ride. Oh, yeah. I I call that riding drunk. Like I will notice my students at that point where we've gone too far. And I'm like, oh, I got a drunk rider. I'm like, you're tired? And they're just like, wow, how can you tell? And I'm like, well... Because I filled the cup and there's no more. And they're like, I'm trying really hard to think. I'm like, at this point, stop thinking. Just focus on smiling. Focus on having fun. And to that sort of previous point, if your front wheel starts to wobble, the easiest thing to do is to engage the core. Because when the front wheel is wobbling, it's because you're not in your body. You're not balanced. And then you try and control the wobble with your arms the wobble's just going to get worse because your arms are like just appendages. Same with those legs. If you don't have solid arms and solid legs, you can't move in those ranges of motion. If you're trying to go side to side and you're doing it by moving the body from side to side, it's not going to work. Like we need to be in that balanced sort of, not rigid, but that position that allows us to make the motions that need to be made, not to be pushed around by the roots or the rocks or whatever's coming at us. And when you add the horse in there, well, thankfully the horse is actually managing the roots and the rocks and the trail because they don't want to stumble. You've just got to manage what you're doing up on top and make sure that horse, because it does have a mind of its own, literally (laughs) is going to go where you want to direct it. And I think life is the same. There's all these people around you that have their own agendas. They've got their own things going on, whether they're your friends, whether they're your employees, whether they're other businesses. You cannot control what somebody else is deciding to do, but you can continue to put yourself where you want to be so that you can be the person that you want to be. It's like when you know your goals, you know what you want to achieve, it makes it easier to make those decisions and on the bicycle you know that you want to stay on the bike you know you want to make it around that corner like so oh I'm coming in a little bit fast what's the easiest decision I'm going to put my brakes on and then I'm going to let myself roll around the corner and it's the same when you're dealing with life situations like you cannot control what's being thrown at you but you can control how you respond and you can control how you focus and where you're clear and not let yourself get impacted by the forces. And I think we're rolling into the why of the conversation here. Why is it so important when you take an upper level to be embodied? Why is it important to not necessarily manage the forces, but manage yourself? So I found this with animals that have really shown me the importance of this. And I learned the the trick with my neighbor's 130 pound Newfoundland. I was dog sitting and she was big enough. She could face swipe me without even blinking. And I didn't really care for that. She's drooly. She's a sweet girl, but I don't really want to be slimed by the dog across my face when she jumps at me. It's not exactly a pleasant experience. And I very quickly realized if I was grounded and in my body, she did not jump. It made me realize with dogs in particular, part of why they're jumping is because they can't reach us because we're up here out of our heads and we are not physically present in our body. When you get physically present in your body, suddenly they don't need to jump anymore because you're here. It was that realization that really made me understand that's why we need to be here because being in our physical body is part of the deal of being a human. It's just what it is. We don't get to bypass that. We can't skip that. We can't change that. That is our reality. And we've even mentioned that there are so many other things that cascade and improve when you can be embodied. It can be very challenging sometimes because emotions have a physical aspect to them. They are feelings, we feel them physically. And there's an awful lot of things in life that are tough. Being able to stay present in your body is very challenging. We also have a ton of distractions that encourage us to not be embodied. 
So we've got all this competing stuff going on, but when we're physically embodied, it improves just about everything across the board. Our animals are great barometers for telling us how well we're doing because they're going to respond accordingly. That was one of my struggles with my horse was that he and I were having problems con- connecting. And when he would get scared, it would scare me. Well, when I would get scared, I didn't know this for a long time, but I was leaving my body even more. Yeah. And so I'm leaving my body and he's already afraid. And then he goes, well, what the heck? You're gone. I guess there really is something to be scared of here, right? And so now we're back and forth ping ponging off of each other. And it was such a bad situation. But as soon as I figured out that if I could stay embodied, he was so much less likely to react. I think we even know this when we encounter people. You can tell instinctually we know when someone else is embodied or not. We just do. It's fascinating, I find, when you work with a group of kids, you're instantly drawn to certain kids and you are repelled as a strong word, but you pull away from other kids, the kid that's totally embodied and they're stoked to be there and they're engaged and they're in charge of what they're wanting to get out of. Even a five-year-old, like I'm here. I love riding my bike. I want to learn some stuff. This person knows how, and they've got this instinctive understanding that if they respond in a positive, fun, and again, my words, but engaged way, they will get the same back. And then you've got the kids that are misbehaving, that are the, when are we going to go on a trail? I don't want to do this. And always that's the person that is scared. And instead of feeling that feeling and being with it and then drawing the information they need out of the situation so that they're not scared anymore, they're leaving their body and you're just dealing with this feeling. And you're actually just encountering the feeling exactly as you say. And as a human, when that happens, you respond the exact same way as the horse does. You pull away. Like, I can't connect with this little person. It's this skill I find of trying to bring that kid back into their body. The idea that emotions are in motion really as an instructor of kids and an instructor of anybody coaching people on bikes, it's really enabling yourself to notice that somebody has left their body, that their fear has disconnected them. How can you reconnect them without actually physically drawing away and having that response that your dog, your horse, even your bicycle, right? Like the bicycle will disconnect from you when you disconnect from it. When you disconnect with what is going on, everything falls apart. And I've always found it really interesting because with kids, they're so cute and and lovable that you can forgive them when they're not necessarily being really enjoyable to be around. But as we get into adulthood, if you don't like someone's energy, why try, right? You're just going to, you're just going to check out. So often I'm like, it's not my job, but I'm like, kid, you can do this. I want to help you. But if you were 20 years older, I'd be hard pressed to want to engage with this because you're not willing to engage with it. You're not willing to step into your feelings, step into your body and actually manage this. You're just throwing it it out at the world. So I think the why is riding a bike is way more fun when you're in flow. We are physical beings in a 3D world. And so when we are present, everything is easier. Everything becomes more fun. Again, everything flows. You're not fighting the forces. So therefore people want to be around you because you're more aligned. You're more enjoyable. You're generally going to be in a better mood. Most of the time you notice when you're out of sorts and you're able to communicate with those around you and say, Hey, you know what? I'm right now struggling to manage the forces that are coming at me. So just Give me a little bit of space and I'm sorry if I'm not quite embodied in the way that I like to show up as I'm struggling with that. But when we're embodied, we notice and we can at least communicate with people back to that subject. We're going to talk about communication one of these days. And at the end of the day, fighting against the forces is really hard. It makes biking really difficult. I was 
on a lesson the other day and I stopped and I said to the girl, I'm like, so the only tip I've got for you right now is that somebody designed this bicycle. It's very nice, very expensive bike that you're riding so that it'll do the work for you. If you are feeling like you are working really hard, you are. And just get into the body, let the bike do its thing. You do what you need to do on top of it and everything will just come together. And that was the tweak she needed to like, oh my God, not that long later, she was flying and in just seventh heaven. It was the coolest thing to watch. So how do we do this? And we've talked a little bit about that, but let's bring it around to the how. So I think what's fascinating to me is you're really highlighting what I see is a gap in awareness and education, because this is not a topic that's talked about all that much. And even frankly, in the horse world where I am, my trainer is one of the few people that has conversations about this, the way that we talk about this. Most people are very focused on the mechanics. This is the way you sit. This is the position you're in. And this is how you do things, but it doesn't really truly bring you into your body. So I see this as a big gap in the awareness in most sports. You're lucky if you find someone who understands the embodiment on this level that can communicate it in your chosen sport. It's not that common right now. And I hope that over time we're moving into a a world where this is more normal, but this does exist already in a lot of places. Yoga, martial arts, Tai Chi, Qigong. These are all things where being embodied is a very normal part of the practice of doing these things. And whether you're completely aware that that's what's happening or not, it's part of the overall philosophy behind these different modalities and different sports. So any activity that is going to encourage you to be in your body is a great one to choose. As long as you're approaching it with the awareness of looking for that connection and looking for that presence and that absolute awareness, where are my toes? Where am I in the chair? Where am I on the bike, on the horse? Where am I in space? That's the simplest place to start is just ask the question. In your daily life, how many times can you pause and just ask, where am I? Where are my feet right now? What does the chair feel like that I'm sitting on? How does my back feel? How does the desk feel against my arms? The more you ask that question, the more you're doing it and the more you're getting it right. That's really all it takes. You can take this to a super advanced level. You can be in yoga practice for years and years and years. You can be in martial arts practices for years and years and years. And I think it is a lifelong journey, but that's where it starts is with the question, where am I now? Where is my body now? Particularly your core, particularly the foundation of wherever you need to move from for whatever activity you're doing. I love that. And I I have to kind of segue just a little bit, but I think I might be one of our biggest fans of this podcast because I find that when I listen to it, Jenny does all the editing. And then as soon as it comes out, I listen to it. And I find that so many of these nuggets, it's like a reminder of like, yeah, where am I in space? Like, how easy is it to just ask, like, where are my feet? Where's my head? And Joe Dispenza has an amazing meditation that's a 20 minute meditation. And it's just like, where are you in space? And it's so good because it grounds you right into that space. I went to a retreat and we did some Qigong and I was like, wow, this is incredible. I actually took it back and I used it before I did my bike lessons for a few of the lessons. And then I kind of just sort of forgot about it because I got busy and I stopped really grounding in myself. And I love this because I came to this conversation with the idea of when I'm teaching biking, what I'm finding is that when we get into our body and we think about where our body needs to be on the trail, everything comes into flow. As we've worked through the conversation, really, it's about where am I in space and what are these little practices? There's a seven minute Qigong challenge that I partook in and I kind of fell off it 15 days in because 
I was too busy running around and letting the forces dictate what I was doing. I remember that used to be a meditation when I was a kid of just sitting there, closing your eyes and feeling your body in the chair. What does it feel like to sit on the chair and just being in space? And when we use these tools and when I think about times in my life that I'm really present, everything flows better. I was saying to Jenny just before we jumped on, I feel like my frown lines on my face, the collagen's finally working or something. And I think it's because I've been getting out and going and doing fun things. Last night, I went and got coached by one of our coaches. I created a coaching program so that I could actually go and get coached. And It's really cool. Like instead of me being the coach, putting myself into the position of being the student, that's a whole other conversation I'd love to have as well of putting yourself into embodying the opposite of what you normally do. As I say, this topic can go so many places. And I think at the end of the day, your mindset is also important. Future visioning is important. There's all of these things. But as Jenny said, like you've got to start with just knowing where we are in space and knowing we're embodying where we are. And I think it's just as simple as that. Ground, take your shoes off, walk outside, feel the dirt. We can probably sum it up and and wrap it up from there. Do you have any other words of wisdom, Miss Jenny? It really isn't complicated. And I think that's something that we have such a habit of overcomplicating things, but we forget how useful this really is because it literally impacts everything. 10 seconds, 10 seconds is all that you really need. I'm pretty sure almost everybody can afford 10 seconds once an hour. Set a reminder in your phone, do whatever you need to do. The results are so powerful. I have seen the results on the horses. I've seen the results on the bike, my own yoga practice. When I am really getting it, there isn't any part of my life that's not impacted. Just try it, experiment, see what happens because I don't think you can mess it up either. (laughs) There's no way to mess it up. You're not going to get it wrong. That's not possible. Just try it. What do you have to lose at this point? Yeah, I love that. It's so true. You can't get it wrong and you have nothing to lose. So get in your body and let us know how this feels. Give us a comment, write a review. Let us know how being in your body really feels. So I'm Natasha Lockie. You can find me on Instagram at Betty Go Hard. What I do in the world is I work with women who are looking to build their confidence, whether it's on a bike wanting to create a dream life, step into something that's scary, building businesses, really just life confidence is what I am. And I do it through the modality of riding a bike because I just love bikes. And I would do that so that you can have more fun because when we celebrate, when we embody what's going on for us, then life just becomes more fun. And honestly, you get stuck in the weeds. Confidence is something that we grow and we learn from. It's not something that we are born with. So I'm here to help you find it and keep it. And what about you, Jenny? Yeah, I'm Jenny Brandon. I'm an animal communicator and energy healer for animals and their people too. And you can find me on the web at soulpetconnections.com and on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube under the same handle. I support people and their pets with relationship challenges, behavior issues, health challenges, And I do that through intuitive connections with the pet. So I receive information from them. And then we work together to put together a plan so that the two of you can begin to thrive again. So leave us comments, like, subscribe, leave us reviews. Let us know if you have any topics that you would love to hear us talk about. We would love to take suggestions. You can find the podcast on all major platforms and ridingintheweeds.com. So we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for joining us.